it is interesting trying to um, come up with a talk um, that's attuned to where people are in their practice and their retreats. I think that, you know, it's, it's great to be able to have our interviews and we had a great little session, um, question and answers this afternoon. Um, but it is, it is different, you know, in terms of not being in the same physical space and not sort of um, having some, some realm of kind of shared experience and ability to kind of uh, attune to what's happening. And I think the independent condition of each of our situations as yogis um, is really brought to light in that, in this reality, you know? And um, I've just been reminded of sort of some things around that in the last few days of talking to folks <coughs> that I thought I'd offer a little bit today um, you know, especially as the retreat goes on, I think we can have a deepening sense of our capacity to actually get quiet and get still and have just as fruitful, meaningful practice um, in this different context. At the same time that the challenges to that also can become more clear um, internal and externally, um, and the ways that we navigate that are um, so important and require really a lot of time to understand and figure out and calibrate. Um, and so I think we feel really good about, you know, helping, helping folks with that and seeing how well everyone's doing and their different conditions and um, you know, the, just as usual, that sense of how much is shared and how much is really individual. Um, there's new dimensions to that, I think, in this these conditions. And it's, you know, I've just sort of reflected on a little bit. I know that we have the um, chapter of uh, my book is, there's a link to it uh, there on the resources page about self-retreat. And, you know, I know that it's, uh, the content is something that of the Dhamma in it is something I have total confidence and total faith in um, and feel like I understand very well. And the, the kind of metaphorical framework of it around gorilla Vipassana, I know is um, uh, for many a little bit like, there's like a kind of contraction, a kind of like, uh, like something about that feels abrasive. <laughs> and, um, and for myself too, you know, it's like, yeah, I wrote this thing, you know, and I also, I, I'll sometimes look at it or I'll think of it and I'll kind of wince, you know, it's just like, Ugh, you know, like, is that, um, is that the challenge of what, what does it mean to sort of put this out in the world? And as I reflect on it and reread it and go to parts where I'm sort of, you know, kind of relooking at it, um, you know, I find my way back to feeling very confident in it, but also understand that it's, um, it's, there's elements of it that are, can be edgy, a little hard to kind of integrate in terms of, I think it's obvious, right? The sense of where we come to this practice out of a desire for freedom and for peace and for inner harmony and love and to be, using the warfares of metaphor, uh, metaphors of warfare um, uh, can feel so counter to that. And, and, and of course, you know, there's, it's not the, uh, it's not the only metaphor and it's not the perfect metaphor, but I do think that there are places where I've come to really see that it is a meaningful metaphor. And it's a metaphor that the Buddha himself took up quite a bit. Um, you'll see over and again in the suttas, the, you know, this conjuring and the, the, the metaphors of, of war, of, of that kind of valor, you know, of uh, that, that sort of flavor of heroism around these, you know, grand armies and sort of what a yogi should be aspiring to um, in their battling with these uh, internal forces. 
the armies of Mara, you know, um, it's, it's spoken of in martial terms a lot. And it's not so much, I think, of what has kind of transmitted over to the West. And I think, um, you know, there's a relief in that. There's a real sense of like, oh, like it's, it's not the whole picture. And we, you know, like Stephen was talking about when he was, you know, with Sayada Upandita of like, God, you know, like yogis we need a little more metta, you know, like we need to actually start with metta. This can't be like we, we do all this like intensive Vipassana, like very rigorous, hardcore uh, practice. And then, and then once we sort of get accomplished in that to some degree, we, we learn the value of loving kindness and compassion, you know, and, and I know Michelle has her version of that as well, where it's like, oh, to some degree, um, the, the tradition is, of course, rooted in kind of patriarchal modes, you know, and the sort of conflictual and the confrontational and the, the sort of um, the masculine version of the heroic energy is, um, is out of balance, you know, in, um, as it is in every major religion in the world and, and so many sort of social things that we encounter. And so to, you know, relieve ourselves of some of the burden of that aggressiveness, of the lack of sympathy, of the lack of patience and softness, um, I think is such an important stage in the um, making the Dhamma um, accessible and relevant really to, to people of all cultures and around the world, you know, that there is a, a place where the, the limitations of that orientation are getting um, revealed and pushed back on um, everywhere. And, um, and so importantly that it happened actually in our own practice, right? That um, I think the way, the most basic way I would describe that in terms of our relationship to this approach to Vipassana is, is when you look at our tradition, whether it's, the sort of more recent of, you know, Mahasi, um, or even really through the suttas and through the Abhidhamma, you know, the, the, and the commentarial tradition, every, uh, everywhere I have found, I will say, or, or 99% of where I've read and studied has taught methods of practice that are about getting closer to the object of whatever experience is happening. So uh, sensation in the body, sensation in the mind, sensation in sound, it's like the method of Vipassana of mindfulness and of concentration is this like, how do we use these, just the basic tools of let's say concentration and mindfulness to bring the attention to something, to aim it, and then to sustain it there over time as it changes. That's the kind of concentration part. And then the mindfulness part is the observation of, well, if we, if we do this very difficult task of actually aiming the attention at an object and sustaining it, we taka, we chara, there's also this process of, of not just fixing the mind on an object or fixing the object in space or time, but of observing what are we seeing when we're able to try to keep up with it as fast as it's happening? What do we see? with this incredible capacity to concentrate. And so this is the essence of the mechanism of insight is aiming the attention, sustaining the attention and observing what we see in that capacity. And of course, it's these classic observations of, you know, that everything is impermanent. Um, everything is because of this, it's, it's not ultimately satisfying. And the other side of impermanence over time is also spatial, is like there isn't a coherent self either, right? There, the, everything mental and emotional, um, the experience of me is also changing constantly. There's nothing stable there either. And so this notion that all phenomena that are conditioned are subject to change and the grasping and the aversion or the spacing out to them are defenses. Um, that the mind has come up with to protect itself, but ultimately defenses that create suffering for ourselves and others. 
And so by seeing things clearly, by seeing things as they are, the mind stops needing to do that. We don't need the defense of greed, of hatred, of delusion, because we see clearly and understand clearly. And in that seeing, we have access to love. We have access to compassion for the suffering that the delusion brings in ourselves and the world. So, of course, the, the method that we, is offered is always about getting closer, getting closer to the object. And I think so much of the approach that we have come to have so much faith in, all four of us, you know, and, you know, many of you as well, is understanding that actually there are limitations to our ability to always be in contact with what is difficult, with what is changing, with what is unsatisfying, with that which is so unfamiliar, actually, in some of just this way of being, that, in fact, our capacity to be with life as it is, is limited. And that the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion are actually much stronger um, at times, very clearly much stronger than the forces of love or wisdom or patience, generosity. And so we find ourselves in this uh, position where we have to recognize that actually there's a value to moving away from the object at times. There's a value of rest, of, of, of actually taking our feet off of the brakes, of not just pushing and uh, doing this kind of like striving hard effort, which is so much of what the kind of like the, the teachings that we've inherited or the way we've interpreted them because of maybe our own conditioning, depending on our, you know, historical family, culture, various backgrounds. However, we interpret what we're hearing to be striving and pushing, um, that there's this other aspect actually, that there's times of rest, there's times of um, not always trying to move, realizing that we're outnumbered, we're outgunned at certain places and we need to move away, that we need protection, we need safety. This is um, become so fundamental actually to our understanding of practice and how we, realize we need to encourage practice for people who are alone and at home and practicing on their own. And so that really is the, the, the essence of why there is this sort of understanding of like how, how the, the gorilla aspect of things works in our, in our practice as a metaphor, right? Of the sense of like, if you're, if you're going to use this sense of like, yes, it does take valor. And, and as much as we might not like the war metaphor as a baseline, we all sit down, you know, we all encounter these challenges, whether it's in our formal practice or just as yogis in life of like, oh, now not going and checking our email, not distracting ourselves all the time, seeing how hard it is actually to come into this quietude, to come into stillness, to come into relationship with the anxiety, relationship with the worry, relationship with anger, relationship with craving, and not just repress or buy into it and get pulled down the stream. Right, we, we recognize that we are oppressed by forces that feel like they're stronger than us, right? There's that humility at times, which is the, if we don't feel more and more humble in our practice, it's like not working, right? If, if the sense of like, you think you're just like more and more like, and it doesn't mean there aren't times where you feel capable and you're like, wow, I feel really good. And there's a sense of like, wow, the concentration is strong and the mindfulness is strong and, and, and the mind is able to be with something that would otherwise be very hard. That's beautiful to feel a sense of confidence, of faith in the mind and the practice, whatever, in ourselves in that way. And yet, yeah, there's, there's many also experiences, right, that should be humbling, <laughs> that show us like, wow, this is tough. This is really, we're up against something that feels stronger than us. And it's one of those places where the Buddha's metaphors feel impossible. You know, we don't feel like we're these valiant warriors with the army of elephants and, you know, rah, you know, this like, wow, we, you see that, oh, we're maybe a little more like these, a small ragtag 
you know, group of rebels, you know, trying to, you know, trying to reconquer our, our uh, as Stephen was saying, our, you know, our, the place of our, our homeland, you know, and we go in a little bit and then we run to the hills, you know, we go in a little bit and when things get overwhelming, we run to the hills. We go in and we run. And actually that is, is quite a very clear, powerful metaphor for our approach to practice and what we're encouraging of everyone, right? That the sense of like, yes, you go to your anchor, you find a place where you feel like you can connect. You try to hang out there. You go through the ups and downs. You go through the, you know, the distractions and the wanderings and the difficult thoughts and the whatever, you know, the difficult experiences, the beautiful experiences. We try to hang out there. But at some point, things start to arise that are overwhelming. Emotions, uh, ideas, physical, you know, painful physical sensations. Um, and there's a time where we recognize that actually to be, to keep forcing ourselves to be close to those, to keep forcing ourselves in, starts to undermine our actual tools, right? The, the tools of love, of compassion, of equanimity, of patience, of mindfulness, of compassion, that in order to keep being with something, we're actually needing to generate aversion. Uh, the anger, the energy that comes from anger, from striving, from wanting, the gritting of our teeth, the sweating. It's like that sense of, wow. And then when we've used those forces to come into a relationship with an experience, where are we? Do we recognize that that's actually a betrayal of our cause, of our calling, of the work that we're trying to do? Where is it actually more skillful to, to move back? To, to move away, to find some distance from the intensity, to find some relief. And while this might not be taught in the tradition as much, there are places where you see it, where you'll, you'll, you'll see glimmers of it, you know? And it's so important, it's so valuable, where it's like, wow, if our, if our deepest commitment is to what we're conjuring in the heart, then actually there might be quite a bit of time that we're needing to move away rather than be involved because whatever has a reason is, is so difficult or so triggering or so challenging to be with. And so this, you know, in our, in our self retreat, there's something totally essential about being able to have some faith in this and to develop it. And so we understand that many people have come to self-retreat from after being on more formal, you know, uh, retreat practice at a monastery or a retreat center where it's very scheduled and, you know, sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk throughout the day. And what we're saying is even in those contexts, actually, we're going to encourage, and if you've sat with us, of course, you know that we do, of real modulation of intensity. Or it's like, okay, when there's, when there's strength, when there's energy, we go for it, we show up, we're into it, we're engaged. And when we're not, we back off. And there's many levels to that. There's the level like while we're sitting and, and something painful arises, do we move to another object? Do we move to sound? right? Something outside of the body. If it's a body sensation that feels very triggering, another part of the body, sound, do those work at kind of restabilizing? If not, do we call upon something else, something more inspiring? You know, uh, a, a practice that involves and requires maybe a little more concentration on loving kindness, on equanimity, on, you know, the many other tools actually outside of these practices that, that are available to us in this tradition, you know, reflecting on the virtues of the Buddha, reflection on death, reflection on, these are all like, there's, there's many, many tools that we have to be able to find the protection of concentration away from a challenging experience. And then at home, there's like this whole other level, depending of course on conditions, but of like, wow, you know, going and taking a walk, you know, going and sitting with a cup of tea and just staring out the window as like a sort of more, sometimes a lighter version of practice that also can get quite intense, but doesn't be, you know, with our eyes open, sometimes it feels like, oh, it's a little more spacious. It's not quite so, um, 
the, the tension and the pressure put on the mind isn't quite so much there. You know, going for a walk, but then also it's like, yeah, reading a book. You know, the sense of like, we have, you know, individually, it's like you give permission for people to do things that might feel very much not like being a yogi. You know, of like, oh, what if you're really just kind of practicing more intensely in the afternoon and during the day, maybe you do a little bit more art or you do a little bit more something that feels in the garden or nourishing. And, and, and you know, it's like these things are really important to understand that there's wholesome distractions. There's ways that you give our uh, minds and hearts a break from feeling like you're putting them in the jackhammer of reality all the time. We let, this, we let the self reconstitute, reform, get familiar, even if we understand ultimately that is a, a refuge that is unstable and the belief in it might cause harm and cause suffering for ourselves. We also know that it's a place where we have a deep, it's a home base that we feel a deep sense of safety in on some level. And so letting the self be there, right? Letting ourselves feel solid, letting ourselves get conceptual, you know? Um, you know, there's folks who we say, it's like, yeah, okay, maybe it's time to watch a movie, you know? And it's like, oh, this feels horrible. It feels like, how can you say that? You know, we're supposed to be yogis or not. And it's like, no, if you're doing it consciously, there's a sense of like, oh, you're, you're letting the mind get conceptual. It is, it is a practical strategy to understand that story is a way that the mind feels safer, feels relieved, right? Especially structured story that is, you know, it's like, we're not saying go read a Dharma book or go, read, go watch a Dharma movie. In fact, we say, no, you want to read something that's more actually distracting. That's gonna let the mind kind of get out of the sense of like self-judgment around practice. Let the mind solidify in a way that you know isn't real, but also isn't causing harm which you want to be careful about, right? It's not like you're just going into, we're going to watch really like heavy stuff or read all this like really like painful things either. It's like, you want to be careful about it, but there is a sense of like, oh yeah, you're modulating, you're modulating the intensity and you start to see, and this is the most important thing is that if you let yourself relax, if you let yourself, if you let the self reconstitute, if you let this, this, the conceptual be okay, right? If you take the intensity off at times, then when you go back to sit, oh, you, your system will trust you to drop in more. That actually you can find for many people, quieter places in practice, deeper places in practice than we will if we're sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, kind of like the forced march. We're not that kind of army, right? We might end up in a hammock in the forest, you know, waiting for the next engagement, reading a book for a little while before things get intense again. And then when they get intense again, there's a sense of capacity. There's a sense of strength. There's a sense of like, oh, I'm not showing up for this battle in the mind and heart after being just like wearing myself out. I'm like refreshed. I feel a little more capable. I feel a little more sense of capacity and strength to show up for something. Now, of course, there's the other side, right? It's not to say, oh, just do art and just watch movies and just read books and like that's your retreat, right? There's a sense of like, no, of course. <laughs> I almost don't have to say another sentence around that, right? It's like, this isn't vacation in the same way. Uh, this isn't, you know, not engaging. You know, the, the mechanism of awakening is still the same. It still requires showing up. Insight, Vipassana still requires concentration. We talk Oichara, mindfulness, all of these things. You still have to watch. But it's understanding that, wow, the, the, the recipe, the ingredients, the, 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 the quantities are maybe not quite the same as we might have imagined. And that it's worth really exploring the range of how much you're resting, how much you're engaging, how much you're moving in, how much you're moving away, even just in our practice, right? Is it okay that at times we sit and it's just like a little bit lighter? We're not trying so hard to get anything. We're really settled back into just hanging out, watching like you're sitting on the stoop, watching the cars go by, watching the trees, watching people walk by. It's just like you're sitting at the park and you're just watching. 
and then there's the times where it's like, oh, you see that after doing that, well, there's some concentration, there's some continuity, there's some capacity to like, oh, what happens if I just sort of like gently incline a little more, bring the attention a little more clearly, you know, a little more um, committed to interest, right? Exploration, curiosity about the nature of the body, the nature of the mind, the nature of these phenomena, the nature of resistance, the nature of acceptance, the nature of love, of compassion, right? Where do we find the energy to be with those things? And something difficult arises, yeah, okay, can we show up for it? And and yes, you know, in the in the big arc of things, we see that there there will be more capacity, right? Because we've let ourselves rest, there will be more capacity to stay engaged, to bear the intensity of unpleasant experience, you know, to to be curious about that which is hard and difficult and which we want to, you know, quiver or run from. You know, there are going to be times then where it's like, oh no, I, there's a capacity, there's strength. I want to stretch. I, I, I want to be free more than I want things to be the way I want them to be. We're not always on one side or the other of that. You know, it's like mm, we, we, we vacillate. Sometimes we really just want things to be the way we want them to be. But we also don't want to spend our whole retreat as yogis just making things nice, just making things more and more comfortable, complaining about the things that aren't comfortable, you know, being upset about, you know, it's like we know conditions right now are not easy for a lot of people here on this retreat, you know, for tons of reasons. And it's not to dismiss the challenge of, of that, but there are times where actually the, the deeper challenge calls up the deeper aspiration, right? The deeper longing to be free. The sense of like, okay, it's difficult. And do we want to be oppressed by conditions? Do we want to be oppressed by our own aversion to how things are? Or do we have some sense of that spirit of that capacity of like, oh, no, we, we know there's a deeper freedom. We know that there can be peace and love, regardless of conditions, even in oppressive conditions that this heart and mind has a capacity for that. Internal conditions, external conditions. And that sense of heroism, that sense of capacity builds, it's there, it's strong. That we do challenge ourselves to sit through things that are challenging, sit through things that are hard, sit through, sit a little longer than we might. That's the other side of this where it's like, oh, you know, there's a lot of permission of how you do your schedule. Maybe you have some very short sittings. Maybe you don't time your sittings always, you know? Maybe you see what is it like to actually sit a little longer if you're feeling comfortable or somewhat capable, somewhat there? What is it like to, to ride the edge of what we think is possible? Here you have this momentum you know, you have all these days left. We're here, right? Kind of in the middle of it. We know that there's like, it's like, like, yeah, we want to encourage that sense of permission and possibility and flexibility, but also determination, spiritual urgency, commitment, dedication, deepening faith in our capacity. One of the places I think we really do see this understanding in the tradition is um, if you look in the Theravada uh, Abhidhamma, the 
structures, kind of philosophical sort of structures of the nature of experience and the philosophy of mind and of knowing and of psychology um, that was, if, if you take the historical perspective, it was developed, you know, after the time of the Buddha. Uh, the tradition will say that it was still with, you know, the, the, the Buddha was teaching this stuff in other realms uh, during his lifetime. And, um, but when you look at that, it's very powerful. The, um, sometimes it's very kind of, or it's organized. That's definitely sure. It's very organized. And so you have these like 25 wholesome mental factors. And of those 12 of them are these pairs that I just want to, um, offer because 12 of them are, you know, the others are, are ones you would more likely kind of recognize, you know, around sort of wholesome, beautiful qualities of mind. But here you also have um, pasadi, tranquility, lahuta, lightness, mududa, malleability, manyata, wieldiness, Pagunyata, proficiency. Ujukata, uh, uprightness. And so I think even just on that level, if you look at like how much, I think I was saying this before, when we're practicing and we, we hear these things about, you know, diligence and determination and that kind of effort that we need that's very strong and very forceful, there's a hardness of mind that gets immediately evoked in that way of thinking, right? This sort of like, oh, you fix the concentration on an object and it's like aiming and sustaining and, you know, there's like a, a hardness to that. And when you look at this, it's like, oh, buoyant, agile, flexible, soft, workable, pliable, dexterous, right? Proficient, familiar, masterful, honest. Different translations of some of these same things. You know, what is that? Like, what if we, what if, if we thought of um, lightness as just as important as energy, you know, or strength, if we thought of, you know, the malleability of mind, right? The fluidity, the dexterity as just as important as, you know, whatever, rapture, concentration, energy, investigation, They'll understand like, oh, actually there are, there are places where you'll see that it's like, you know, this, this lightness, this, this flexibility, this dexterity of approach is, is important. It is valued. It's, it's cultivated, you know, it's not just uh, attack all the time. That's the, that's the essence of this, you know, it's not just attack all the time, but it's also not just not doing anything all the time. T. Lawrence, uh, who is a, you know, master of uh, guerrilla approaches. Um, he wrote, battles in Arabia were a mistake since we profit in them only by the ammunition the enemy fired off. We had nothing material to lose. So our best line was to defend nothing and to shoot nothing. Right, the sense of like, oh, their their strategy was all just dismantling uh, railroads and infrastructure, right? The way that we would with sort of dismantling the the infrastructure of greed, of hatred, of delusion, right? Through the cultivation of um, goodwill, of ethical conduct. You know, our best line was to shoot at nothing and to defend nothing. In the sense that it doesn't always have to be conflict, even when it feels like we're at war. Right, even when it feels like we're under attack, where, what is the, where do the tools of love take us, right? Where do we, where do we rely on the tools of compassion for ourselves, on dexterity of mind, on fluidity, on ease of kind of non-dogmatism in terms of our approach? How much of our effort to get free is coming out of aversion to who we are? 
right? Not liking ourselves, wishing we were different. The sort of toxicity of that attitude, of that mental approach, it's very painful. And what is it to, to, to incline a different way, right? To this permission, to the sense of understanding, to this relaxation, to this uh, release and relief. You know, the other beautiful thing that Mahasi offers that I think is so important is you'll, we'll find a lot in the tradition, uh, this emphasis on concentration that you need to have like a totally fixed absorptive concentration in, able to, in, in order to be able to, you know, penetrate the nature of reality and, and have insight. And Mahasi understood uh, practically and also um, um, academically the ways in which, oh no, actually momentary concentration is enough. Right, that momentary concentration, this ability to move with experience as it's moving, right? That we don't need this sort of huge, powerful, fixed force of mind before, uh, you know, that's like an overwhelming capacity of concentration in order to be able to have insight. It's like, no, every moment is changing. Every moment, it's like noticing and noting, right? The changeable nature of every moment that actually this kanika samadhi, this momentary concentration ultimately develops the same capacity, the same depth and profundity of strength. And yet it happens through the lightness, through being with things as they are. And like, check that out in your practice. You know, when you're trying to concentrate on the breath, or concentrate on sound, where is your, is your, are you intentionally making the, the attention like lead, you know, this heaviness of like, oh, and sometimes that is a, that's a downside a little bit of just the language of anchoring, right? This idea of like, you're dropping this like heavy thing onto experience versus like, no, actually experience is flooding by. It's moving so fast. It's inconceivable. And so what does that mean about concentration? What does that mean about how fast actually, how malleable, how light, how fluid, how dexterous the mind actually needs to be to be able to keep up with reality as it's changing? It's totally different. It feels very different. You don't sit down on your cushion and kind of, you know, crunch your face and grit your teeth and clench your fists and like, I'm gonna get this. It's like that, the, the, the harder we push, the harder we fall, it's like you have to have this lightness, this dexterity. And what is that like? It's like, oh, and that fluidity of like, okay, we might be basically bringing the attention to the breath at the abdomen as our primary object, but something else arises. No problem. The attention is there. Something else arises. No problem. The attention is there. And it's like, okay, you have this fluidity. But on the other hand, can that start to feel like too wild and too crazy? And it's like, oh, all right. Then we bring a little bit more sense of solidity, right? A little bit more sense of um, uh, confining the attention, contracting the attention as a safety, as a protection, as like, oh, what is it like to just be with this? And to see the relaxation actually and the rest that can come from the, re it's really a concentration as a renunciation not as a enforcement. The sense of like, okay, we're just letting that go. We're letting that go. We're letting that go. And the relief and the release, right? You think about the seven factors of awakening. You have mindfulness, um, investigation, energy, rapture, calm, concentration, equanimity. To know that concentration is on the calming factors versus the energizing factors. And how much of that feels intuitive or how much does that feel counterintuitive, right? To really feel like, oh, concentration can be relaxed, a relief, a rest, not hardening, a constricting, a tightening.
whether we like it or not, there is, I think, this internalization of some of these army kind of imperial, imperial metaphors, even from the Buddha's time, right? The sense of like a regular army will try to conquer a place and, you know, consolidate its power and then expand, right? That's how the army, these sort of traditional kind of, it's real, they call it real estate, right? It's like you land somewhere, you conquer it, you solidify it, you expand, you expand, you expand. And I think that, you know, the sense of that this path is linear like that is something that I think we all will fall victim to at some point of like, oh, it's like you start here and little by little, it just grows and your mindfulness grows and your love grows and you, you just, you develop in this sort of like, you know, the, you're, you're conquering this, is, you know, our, our homeland again uh, through this practice in this very kind of predictable linear way. And yet like, almost no one ever has that actual experience over time, right? There's a sense of like, God, I've been at this forever and I feel like less capable now, you know, or I'm, I'm more sensitive to my own aversion, to my own greed, to this like, oh, I'm starting to see, I'm actually, maybe I'm a deluded type and I always thought I was a greedy type or whatever, you know? These things start to become clear. And that is part of this, like, no, it's momentary. It's like, yeah, this, this guerrilla approach is not fixated on like, oh, we're winning this and we're gaining this and we're strengthening and we're amplifying. We're just growing in this linear way. It's like, we win here, we hide. We win here, we get we're overwhelmed. We win here, we get we're overwhelmed and we run. We move away, we back off. We come back in when we're stronger. It's like, this is actually the approach we teach, whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, this is the, it is the method, right? It's understanding uh, as, um, Carlos, Jose Carlos uh, Maria Tegui wrote metaphorically, right? El capitalismo no puede más y el socialismo no puede todavía. Capitalism can't anymore, but socialism still can't yet, right? It's like, you might not like the situation of the oppressive conditions of greed, hatred, and delusion that we're on and under and that we're participating in and perpetuating all the time. But we also know that our little revolutionary fervor also actually isn't quite there yet. Like it doesn't have the capacity at this point to be in control, to run things. And so we're in this dance, we're in this middle terrain which is hard, right? It requires this coming and going, this ebbing and flowing, this, this galvanizing the force when it's there and releasing when it's not there and when we're overwhelmed. And particularly at this point in our practice, in a retreat, we will start to come upon the places that are not just the normal day-to-day -day challenges, not just, okay, achy back or achy knee. I mean, those things will still happen, you know? But we start to enter the terrain of really like what we would call karmic knots, you know, this, this place of like these deeper bounded tensions between our bodies and our minds of like deep habitual patterns to difficulty, to trauma, to just existence, you know, that we may have developed very young or not in any even coherent way. They are patterns of behavior that um, are often deeply interwoven in mental behavior, mental culture um, around certain triggers, certain stimulus, certain longing, certain places of despair, certain sense of hopelessness, certain flavors of uh, anger or rage that are just so deeply familiar to us, right? They feel like a kind of core self, right? The sense of who we are and so much so that they're often hard to see, you know, uh, talk since Steve spoke a little about doubt right of like boy those doubt thoughts are so hard to see we're so we believe them so much you know uh, we believe them to be true so deeply and so uh, you know there are other versions of this of anger fear um, places where it's usually like the places where we want like our deepest healing is and and they're the places we are most impatient with in ourselves, right? The most fed up with, the most um, tired of. And so if we see them, when we don't see them, 
they're like how we're perceiving everything and everything is caught up in our karmic knots. If we see them, often we want to get rid of them. We want to destroy them. We want to obliterate them. We just wish they would just go away. And yet we're in this dance of like understanding that actually that aversion, that hatred, um, the exhaustion from it isn't going to be the tool that actually unbinds, unhooks, resolves, releases. But that we're so, the patterns are so slippery that we also can't necessarily be in a wholesome relationship with it all the time. We can't always just bring love to our places of deepest self-hatred, right? We can't always bring clear seeing to our places of deepest rage or fear. So these are the places where this tactic and this approach is, is most important, where you see that it's like, oh, we are overwhelmed. We are what where the mind is, and it requires this awareness of what's happening in the mind right now. What are the what are the sources, the forces that are that are arisen, that are available? How how are they in comparison to what I'm up against? And where do we see like, oh, okay, I can touch into this. I can try to bring a little like interest, be curious about it. And where do it's like, no, I need really need to back off. And then to what degree of backing off is it like? just moving to a different anchor in the attention, going for a walk, stopping practicing for the afternoon, right? Taking a nap, resting, mental distraction of, of whatever kind, cultivating joy. Imagine that, right? Cultivating something that feels good, right? Nourishing ourselves with something, even if we don't think it's, we know it might not be ultimately satisfying that we give our systems a break, we give our systems a rest, we let ourselves out of this conflict, right? Until it dies down, until we sort of feel like, wow, okay, it's, it's played through something, I've given myself enough space, and we come back to the breath, or we come back to, to something else, not even to necessarily come back to this huge fire, right? To the, the sort of central power of greed, hatred, and delusion. Be careful about like, oh, when I'm strong, then I'm going to go back and figure this thing out and I'm going to untangle it. And I'm going to unbind it. It's like that agenda with fixing, that agenda of changing, that agenda of like manipulation is part of what will make it lock in even harder. Right? Where do we sort of have the sense of companionship, of gentleness, of care, but of, of healthy distance at times, right? of not always moving in, but also moving away. We, you know, ever since coming to, you know, Hawaii, a lot of times you'll see um, people bringing their newborn babies, you know, to the ocean for the first time. And um, it's often very powerful. And I think there, there was a time where I myself was in a place on self-retreat of just like incredible anguish and angst. You know, I, I really feel, I felt like all well, the concentration was building and I was like really kind of getting into the zone of the practice. And I was just, you know, like th that, that sense of something is around, something good is around the corner. You know, something good is about to happen. But you can, now it's like looking at that, it's like, oh, it's so future oriented. Right? It's like this thing is, this thing is gonna, I don't know, something's good is going on. You know, I'm getting something. And that, that sense of sort of like, yeah, things coming together started to dissipate. You know, the drive that I was using, the, the sort of the, the push, the, the, the tension I was applying to the present moment started to drain the energy, drain the factors of awakening. And it got, you know, uh, you know, as, and as it drained and as things started to feel like a little less quiet and a little less concentrated, it's like my mind got tighter and tighter and tighter trying to, you know, fix this thing, trying to force this kind of back into more concentration. Um, up until the point that I, you know, really just got myself in a huge tangle, you know, and it became this, yeah, ex ex self-doubt, incapacity, what's wrong, you know, just like, like every, every place that it could um, manifest in terms of negative self-belief or 
negative belief around the practice or, you know, humiliation and, and sense of defeat around my own ambitiousness and um, capacity. And so, um, you know, at that point, I was fortunate to be able to, 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 to have that sense of permission, you know, that uh, Michelle had really trained me in of like, okay, you take a break, right? You've exhausted yourself. You've, you've got, you've, you've exploded something <laughs> and you're not actually in a position to just like keep checking it out, to feel, to come to, you don't have the, you don't have the platform to be investigating or to be caring or anything. It's like you drained. And so what then? Like, okay, re, re-inspire, re, you know, give yourself some nourishment, take a rest, uh, do something that feels good. And so I went to the ocean and um, saw this, this scene, you know, the scenario, which, you know, I've seen other places as well, even in my own childhood in Massachusetts at the lake or at the ocean of, um, I saw this, this father, you know, bring his, have his little uh, newborn baby and kind of wade into the ocean. And, um, you know, very gently kind of introducing this child to the, the cold water you know, this vast expanse of the ocean. And this sort of awe and this amazement and curiosity and wonder that however many moments that lasted and then fear and discomfort and crying, you know, and like, you know, any of us would know what this father did. It's like, oh, at that point, you take the baby out of the water, you bring it closer you soothe, you pacify, you, you remind it that it's cared for, you, you give that sense of protection, of nurture. And then when it, you know, rested and felt safe, it's like, okay, reintroduce back into the water, back into the ocean. And this process of just back and forth. And then, oh, the baby hit its edge again, come back. We release, we come back. This sense of, like that's how our hearts are with this ocean of, of, of the universe, the ocean of mind and body, of being, of existence, of, of all of these realms we can explore. We have this ambition, we have this desire to be free, you know, to, and to just cast ourselves out into that freedom. We're tired of the bondage we feel of our, you know, this, this state of angst and of internal oppression that we, we know we have. We want to be free. And yet our system, we can't just toss the baby into the ocean. Think about how often we do actually think we can do that to ourselves. How painful that is, how sad that is. Instead, it's like, oh, here we're learning. We gently move in, we gently pull back. We gently move in, we explore, we're courageous, we find the limit of our capacity. We try to hang out there, you know, we try, because we're both, right, parent and child in this scenario. <laughs> we have some agency around this. But then when we know we're overwhelmed and we feel like we're in real danger, when it's real fear, it doesn't matter if it's rational, it doesn't, that is irrelevant. We, 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 we can we pull back, we pull out, we go to safety, we go to comfort, we go to security in whatever way we find it. We feel good about that. We feel good about the sense of like, oh, not always moving in, coming back. That's actually good practice. It's not like, and it's not like an alternative to practice or a sense of like, oh, we do this so that we can practice better. This is practice. Moving away is practice. Finding safety is practice. Finding relief is practice. Finding comfort, finding joy, finding stability, finding security in what is familiar is practice. And over and little and slowly by time, we find security in a greater and greater expanse of conditions, a great into the ocean of reality so that we find security everywhere ultimately. But that this 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 path is one of moving back and forth, of moving in and out, right? It isn't just this straight line from here to there. 
how much can we internalize that? How much can we care about ourselves that much? Be so committed to the tool of love and interest to not hurt ourselves in our practice, to not betray ourselves in our spiritual practice, to not betray the Dhamma in our attempt to understand and unbind from these oppressions. Someone mentioned this uh, Rhinoceros Sutta in an interview. And I think that there is this challenge of practicing alone, you know, and the, the Buddha would say, you know, community and Sangha and how valuable and important it was, but that it's, you know, sometimes you just can't find a good companion And in those cases, we wander alone like a rhinoceros. Taking off the householder's marks like a coral tree that has shed its leaves, going forth in the ochre robe, wander alone like a rhinoceros. Showing no greed for flavors, not wanton, going to house to house for alms with mind unmeshed in this family or that, wander alone like a rhinoceros. Abandoning barriers to awareness, expelling all defilements, not dependent, cutting aversion, affection, wandering alone like a rhinoceros, turning our back, our back on pleasure and pain as earlier with sorrow and joy, attaining pure equanimity and tranquility, wander alone like a rhinoceros. Intent on the ending of craving and heedful neither drooling nor dumb, but learned, mindful, wander alone like a rhinoceros, unstartled, unsnared, unstartled like a lion that sounds, unsnared like the wind in a net, unsmeared like a lotus in the water, wander alone like a rhinoceros. At the right time consorting with the release through goodwill, Compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, unobstructed by all the world, by any world, wander alone like a rhinoceros, having let go of passion, aversion, delusion, having shattered the fetters, unfazed at the ending of life, wander alone like a rhinoceros. Take a nap like a rhinoceros. Rest <laughs> like a rhinoceros. It's wonderful to come a few times a day to this Dhamma waterhole with all these rhinoceroses and drink together from this uh, refreshing well. So, thank you for your time and uh, take care of yourselves and. Um, strive on, but gently. Yeah, we'll see you soon for the metta chanting. <laughs>